Hi friends, my name is Emily and welcome back to Lumos Illuminating Harry Potter. This is episode two where we are looking at the context in which Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone came out and so for that we're going to talk a little bit about what children's literature is, what the market looked like at that time and then we're going to look at another piece of children's literature and talk about a key theme from children's literature. I think it's important to talk about what children's literature is. So the term describes both a set of texts and an academic discipline and it's a bit of an oxymoron. Children are these sort of innocent, unlearned, beings, they are minds for molding. To paraphrase the Hogwarts song, we're going to fill the children's brain up with stuff because they, they've just been collecting dust and fluff over the summer. Whereas I think literature carries with it the idea of learnedness, of high art, of adults, sort of this like on a pedestal elitism. And so to group the two together, children's literature it's literature for the unlearned. There is a scholar named Roderick McGillis who wrote, quote, books for the young still carry the burden of perceived simplicity that sets them outside the complexities we associate with literature for adults, end quote. It's a weird term to begin with. So how has children's literature been defined? I've seen it defined as any text read by any child, but that isn't really a useful definition either. I was nine when I first read Pet Cemetery. That does not make Pet Cemetery children's literature. Another scholar, Jack Sipes, feels children's literature doesn't exist because, quote, there has never been a literature conceived by children for children, a literature that belongs to children, end quote. And that's true as well. And we will come back to that idea in a moment. What does children's literature mean to me? It's a text for children. Children are the target audience and that is slightly more useful. The literature being defined by its audience is more useful than any book read by any child. The problem is that folks can't agree on how to define children either. Who qualifies as a child? In what context? In what society, right? And like texts that were for adults then have maybe been incorporated into children's literature now and I'm sure those texts will continue to change and shift as our society's idea of what a child is changes. So it's a weird thing to define. A common definition and the definition that I think we're going to use to discuss the Harry Potter series throughout Lumos is from Miles McDowell, quote, children's books are generally shorter. They tend to favor an active rather than passive treatment with dialogue and incident rather than description and introspection. Child protagonists are the rule. Conventions are much used. The story develops with a clear-cut moral schematization which much adult fiction ignores. Children's books tend to be optimistic rather than depressive. Language is child-oriented and plots are of a distinctive order." End quote. I think this definition functions, it works, but I also think it sort of in some ways devalues some of the fantastic texts that are out there for children that can definitely be enjoyed by adults. And I think we can challenge this idea that children's texts are like simple and dialogue fo focused rather than descriptive with texts like The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien or the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials, and of course Harry Potter. All of these texts are quite meaty and while like the surface of the text is appealing to children, it appeals to pieces of this definition, but for adult readers there's a lot in there to piece apart and that's why scholars find these texts interesting. Harry Potter falls into this camp of children's literature. To start out with, the first three books are safely within the realm of children's literature, middle grade fiction. They are short, they are fast-paced, they are 
things that you can read alone. You don't necessarily have to have read one, two, and three in that order. They are very much about the dialogue and the actions of the characters. Those first three stories especially have very clear-cut morals. We have good versus evil, Harry versus Voldemort, Gryffindor versus Slytherin, and I think at the end of each one, they are optimistic, ultimately at the end of the day, right? Like when we get to the end of Philosopher's Stone, we have Dumbledore talking about how it was love that saved Harry, right? It was love that protected Harry, and so everything ends on a very optimistic note, even though Voldemort is technically not dead. We know that Voldemort is back. He's a big bad. Uh, we could focus on that, but we don't. It's children's literature, so we focus on love and Harry being protected by love and now having this loving group of friends and folks who care about him, right? The language is child-oriented. It's very easy to read, which we're going to talk about in a minute with the context. So let's get to the context of Harry Potter. So the first thing that we need to keep in mind with this context is that children's literature is is prescriptive. It's written by adults, it's published by adults, it's marketed by adults, it's sold by adults, it's purchased from the bookstore by adults who then give it to their children. At no point in the creation and acquisition process are children involved. So what you are looking at with these covers, yes it has to appeal to the child, but you're also very much selling the adult. So let's just compare these two covers for a minute. So in the original covers that I had growing up as a child, these are the UK Canada covers by Raincoast. If you look at the original covers, there's a boy and he's at a train station. We see this big steam engine, it's labeled express train, you see like a sort of via rail, more modern sort of train in the background. The boy is wearing a scarf and a jacket, he's got a white collared shirt on, he's got the strap of his backpack over his shoulder, and the font is pretty boring, pretty standard. Compare that to the latest edition of the text. Uh, these are the editions published by Bloomsbury. These are available in Canada and I believe the States as well. I'm not sure about the UK if there are different covers. But for these new editions, we see a lot more atmosphere and mystery to them, right? They are purple and like orange and yellow and it creates a sort of twilighty mood to it. This text is all wonky and it's curly and it's shiny. It's not mechanical and boring. This is like fantastical, a little bit magical text and that's emphasized with these gold foil stars all around it. Gone is the boy in his like white collared shirt and jacket. We have this weird roby thing that doesn't look like anything that a child today would wear. There is this giant beardy man on the front and he's carrying an old tiny lantern. We see this looming castle in the background that doesn't look quite structurally possible. It's just a completely different vibe that we're getting from the latest editions versus the first editions. This totally makes sense because in 1997 there wasn't a lot of fantasy on the market. Adults decided that children should be really into realism. I'm not saying that children weren't into realism or that they weren't into fantasy. Because children have no part in the production and publishing of books, uh, it's adults who decide what's in the market, what they think they can sell, right? In the early 90s, it was incredibly hard to get fantasy published. There were some big names, but again, fantasy wasn't in vogue. Right now, ever since Harry Potter, fantasy has been one of those evergreen genres in children's literature, but at this point in time, before Harry Potter was published, there was a real dry spell. Uh, nobody wanted to buy fantasy, no one wanted to publish fantasy. In 97, when Harry Potter finally was published, somebody took a chance on it, it enters into a market that is dry of new fantasy. It makes Harry Potter seem a lot more original than it really is, which is one of the reasons I had us read Ava Ibbotson's Secret of Platform 13 alongside this. Also, Harry Potter has these like good old England vibes with the tech or lack thereof. The family arrangements are very nuclear and um, 
They feel very 1950s to me, even though Harry Potter is set in like the late 80s. That sort of nostalgic vibe for the type of England that Harry is growing up in at the start of the series uh, apparently performed really well in the original UK market. A lot of these working pieces lead to Harry Potter being a very sellable text. We have the mystery plot line plus the chosen one plot line. These are like pretty uh, standard things and they're very easy to sell, right? Like it's easy as a bookseller to hook somebody on this, ooh, there's a mystery plot line, somebody's trying to steal this magical object, and chosen one Harry Potter who survived Voldemort trying to murder him is on the case, right? Like, doesn't that sound like a fun book? It's a very sellable plot. Uh, the writing is super accessible. The nature of the market, like we discussed, the lack of fantasy literature means that it appears like super special. You know, there's not a lot like it to compare on the market at the time. And then, the internationalization of the market. Uh, this was super important for the book experience we have today, and it was important to the success of the Harry Potter series. So prior to the 1990s, the book markets around the world were super regional. The US market was very separate from the UK market, and I can only speak to those two markets, but I imagine that any smaller presses in other countries were also very regional. And that division was felt in children's literature. It meant that UK kids and US kids had very different formative reading experiences just based on the texts that were available to them. And so I'm sure that if you are like in the same age bracket as I am, mid-20s, early 30s, we are on the cusp of that shift. And so if you're a bookish person and you're watching a lot of these videos, you watch booktube videos um, from folks in the UK and you see like the books that made me and they bring up pieces of children's literature that were super formative to them. And if you then watch folks in the US do like books that made me and see what their formative pieces of children's lit from their childhood were, you will see probably very different texts. That I would imagine is not the case for young people today just based on how um, loose and accessible, I suppose, the markets are. There were exceptions. There are super special snowflake authors who did make the jump across the pond. C.S. Lewis traveled from the UK to the US and E.B. White, the writer of Charlotte's Web, traveled from the US to the UK. But that was the exception and not the rule. The UK Commonwealth places, I'm Canadian, so a lot of the books that I grew up with are UK texts. Like, in addition to reading a lot of Canadian literature, I did read a lot of British literature over American literature. Uh, as a UK Commonwealth place, we did receive UK texts in the Canadian market. However, Canadian texts did not make it back across the pond. So this all changed when publishing houses began to merge across national boundaries. Another thing that contributed to the internationalization of books was Amazon, of course. Before Amazon sold bits and bobs, it was a bookseller. Uh, it was an online book retailer that f uh, frequently sold things from different countries. So it would stock UK authors on its US website and vice versa. This allowed folks to buy direct. In my research, I actually came across uh, the mention that you might write to somebody, like if you had family in the UK and you wanted the latest insert UK author here, you would like write to your aunt and be like, hey, can you pick this up for me? And you would mail it to the US. There was no way for the booksellers to do that until Amazon came along and started stocking these different, like, regional authors on their websites, right? So finally, you could buy these things for yourself. The last thing that really affects the sales of Harry Potter. In 1997, the UK abandoned the net book agreement, by which book cover prices were fixed. This meant that discounting was now possible, and it allowed for the creation of loss leaders, 
like Amazon. The last three Harry Potter books were actually sold at a loss. So in addition to books now being accessible and discountable, meaning more people have access to them, more people can afford to purchase them, they are in the hands of more humans. We also have the rise of the internet and the fanfiction communities. Fanfiction was always a thing. There were actually fanfiction zines, like printed zines before the internet existed. But alongside Harry Potter, we see the rise of online fanfiction sites. And with the rise of online fanfiction sites, we saw the adult readers expand. There is a lot of queer Harry Potter fan fiction that was being written by adults, so suddenly these texts are no longer just in the hands of children. These texts are in the hands of adults, to the point that publishing houses actually printed adult editions so that adults wouldn't feel embarrassed to be carrying around a book that looks like this, clearly children's literature. I think it's also important to acknowledge how crucial the Harry Potter series was when it came to the children's fantasy market. It revitalized the children's fantasy market. It made it healthy again. It brought many children's fantasy texts back into print. It also changed how publishers treated the writers of children's fantasy. Because suddenly this text that is like part of like genre fiction, it's not real, it's not contemporary, it's just silly escapism, suddenly these texts are sellable, they're valuable. It's cool that it had such a big impact. Building on this popularity of fantasy is 9-11. The Harry Potter series was already in progress when 9-11 happened. 9-11 happens. We see a decline in realism and an increased interest in fantasy literature for escapism and dystopia because it's scary. It's scary. Folks don't want the real. The real has happened right there in America. Folks want to escape. I mean, think of the rise and the massive success of fantasy in young adult literature at this time too, the supernatural romance. Think of Twilight, which is entirely isolated to forks, and it, like, no outside politics, no outside real world stuff. It is just a girl who has two boys who want to kiss her. They're both hot, and they both want to kiss her, and that's the biggest problem, right? It was just like the perfect storm that leads to Harry Potter being the massive success that it is. And so I think it's important to remember that context. Now we're going to talk about the other piece of children's literature that I included, which is The Secret of Platform 13 by Ava Ibbotson. This came out in 1994, and the reason I picked it is because I'm a little bit of an asshole. Many readers find it very similar to Harry Potter. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone came out in 1997, so here are some of the similarities if you didn't read the book. Both novels mention a platform on King's Cross Station in London that leads to a different world. Both have a boy orphan as their protagonist. Both depict that boy being mistreated or treated as a servant by adults in a caregiving position. Both boys sleep in cupboards. Both books have a spoiled, overweight child that is doted upon by their mother. Both have boys who are secretly really important and belong in a fantasy world that they are unaware of. And journalist Amanda Craig actually wrote that, quote, Ibbotson would seem to at least have a good case for plagiarism, but Ibbotson says she would like to shake Rowling's hand because we all borrow from each other as writers, end quote. So aside from the portal being in King's Cross Station, which seems fairly specific. Many of the elements that I just mentioned are just common in children's literature. I pull these two texts together and highlight some of their similarities because I want to, like in the kindest way possible, try and remove Harry Potter from its pedestal while at the same time doing a whole series focusing on it. So, you know, putting it on the pedestal. Sort of talk about how it is very similar to a text that is of its contemporary, right? One of its predecessors, actually. For those of you who didn't read the book, Platform 13, it's a magical portal that links between this magical island and the human 
regular folks, non-magical world. And this uh, portal in King's Cross has been closed for nine years and nine days. Shortly before it opens, the queen of the island gives birth to a baby boy. The three nurses of the prince take the prince to London to get fish and chips on the last day that the portal is open. They get real distracted by their fish and chips. A woman who really, really wants a baby named Mrs. Trottle sees the buggy unattended outside the fish and chip shop and she steals the baby and replaces it with a doll. The nurses, realizing that they don't have a lot of time until the portal closes, rush off with the buggy. It isn't until after the portal closes that they realize that they left the prince in London, and now they have to wait another nine years and nine days for that portal to reopen. In nine years, a rescue group is sent to find the prince. They track him back and they find a Raymond Trottle who has grown up to be fat, lazy, and very spoiled. Those are the words of the book, not me. He relies on television and computer games and toys to like get through his day. We also meet Ben, the household's child servant. Stuff happens in the middle and spoilers, when Ben's nanny dies, she reveals that he was the kidnapped prince and Ben is brought back to the world where he belongs and he's reunited with his parents and it's all good and happy. So Ava Ibbotson's Secret of Platform 13 is a good fun time. If you like Harry Potter, you might want to give it a try, especially if you're into middle grade fiction or your little person is into middle grade fiction. It is fun. It is a good read. But the reason I had us read them together, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and Ava Ibbotson's Secret of Platform 13, is to talk about a huge theme in children's literature and that is food. Food in literature is symbolic. Food often symbolizes emotional nourishment. Not in all cases. Food can symbolize other things. Today we're going to talk about food as it symbolizes emotional nourishment. Who provides food to children, stereotypically speaking? Their parents. Good, loving parents make food to nourish their children. So when we're reading children's literature, we should be paying attention to who is and is not providing food to our child protagonist and what type of food they provide. Also important is food's opposite, which is hunger, the lack of food. In children's literature, this lack of food is linked to a hunger for love and attention. So let's have a look at how food plays out in both The Secret of Platform 13 and Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Quote, Dudley was very fat and hated exercise, page 21. Quote, Harry had always been small and skinny for his age, end quote, also page 21. We have to set aside the fat phobia here for a moment. There's an argument to be made that fatness is linked to badness in the Harry Potter series, and that is a valid argument, but that is not the argument that we are looking at today. Dudley is showered with love and affection, and we know this because he is overweight. He does not hunger for love or affection or attention. He has an overabundance of attention and symbolically we see his parents giving that love and affection through food. In contrast, Harry, who is neglected by the Dursleys, is small and skinny. He isn't nourished in the same way as Dudley is. We can see that exemplified in the scene where Harry goes to the zoo. Quote, the Dursleys bought Dudley and Pierce, Dudley's friend, large chocolate ice creams at the entrance to the zoo. And then, because the smiling lady in the van asked Harry what he wanted before they could hurry him away, they bought him a cheap lemon ice lolly. So the Dursleys shower their son and his friend with love and affection. They buy them expensive chocolate ice creams. Uh, cream is a thing that you see in a lot of older children's literature, that when children have milk and cream and butter and these like fatty rich dairy items. They are well cared for because it was thought that children needed these extra calories and specifically these dairy fatty things. In contrast, Harry gets frozen lemon water. I assume it's a popsicle. It's presumably synthetic lemon at that and it is just frozen flavored water and it is the cheapest thing that they can find on the menu. So the 
quality disparity there uh, between what the Dursleys provide their son versus what the Dursleys provide Harry. That food there links to how much love and attention they are giving to each child. Then we see that once Harry goes to Hogwarts, Hogwarts provides an abundance of food to its students and the dinner table becomes a place where the kids are allowed to eat intuitively. So on page one, I keep picking up the book that I didn't read for this. On page 131, the food materializes on the plates in the dining hall. Quote, Harry's mouth fell open. The dishes in front of him were now piled with food. He'd never seen so many things he liked to eat on one table. Roast beef, roast chicken, pork chops and lamb chops, sausages, bacon and steak, boiled potatoes, roast potatoes, chips, Yorkshire pudding, peas, carrots, gravy, ketchup, and for some strange reason, mint humbugs. The Dursleys had never exactly starved Harry, but he'd never been allowed to eat as much as he liked. Dudley had always taken anything that Harry really wanted, even if it made him sick. Harry piled his plate with a bit of everything except the humbugs and began to eat. It was all delicious. So the idea that Hogwarts provides its children with abundance and allows the children to choose what they want to eat, um, to nourish their bodies in ways that feel good to them, or maybe not so good, like, but it's teaching the children to eat intuitively, right? That, you know, they might spend the first three or four days at Hogwarts eating nothing but chicken legs and chocolate cake and then end up really constipated and learn how to eat, maybe. Be like, hey, maybe vegetables are a good idea. I don't know. The idea that Hogwarts provides the children with nourishment is important. And a lot of things happen around the dining table in the series. Um, the place where the food happens is the place where community happens in a lot of cases. It's a place where uh, Gryffindors of different ages come together and they have an opportunity to talk and to do homework. I think this is more apparent in the films, which is maybe because, you know, limited number of sets, but there's a shot in the first Harry Potter film where you see the dining tables being used as study tables and there's no food on the tables, so it's not like they're studying over breakfast. It's a space where the kids go to study and to like chat and a lot of the big things that happen like plot wise in regards to the mystery in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone happen around the table so we see that uh, again the link between the place of nourishment in this case the table Hogwarts is also a place that facilitates community facilitates friendship and conversation and I think that's interesting as well we see this similar dynamic with food in The Secret of Platform 13. So on page 54, the rescue party is spying on Raymond and this little boy they see doing um, the tasks. Quote, the boy's tasks were still not done. Back in the scullery, he took out a mop and a bucket and began to wipe the floor. Was he perhaps working a little too hard for a child who had not yet had breakfast? The folks on this rescue party observing this child doing labor for the Trottle household note his neglect. Like he is not being provided with food. He's working really hard. Mrs. Trottle does not emotionally nourish Ben and she doesn't like physically with food nourish him either. So we see that that link between food and emotional nourishment. We also see the link between fatness and an abundance of love. So on page 64, we learn that, quote, Raymond Trottle was extremely fat, end quote. They give him whatever he wants, right? So like they they will spare no expense, like physical expense on Raymond and also emotional expense. Like there's an outpouring of emotional nourishment for Raymond. Just like Dudley, Raymond's fatness links to that overabundance of nourishment. We see that the fat child in both of these texts does not hunger for love or attention from their parents. Whereas the underweight protagonist who is being abused 
starves for love and attention. That's just an interesting thing to keep in mind as we go forward reading this children's literature. Look at how food comes into play because food does come into play through the rest of the Harry Potter series as well and I think that will be something to maybe touch briefly on once we get Harry Potter into the Weasley burrow. We will see food and emotional nourishment linked there as well. My first question for you all is, what is your relationship to the Harry Potter series? It is my childhood. I grew up reading the series, I grew up loving the series, and then I started to study it in an academic setting till I finally wrote my master's thesis on Harry Potter. So mine is a deeply entwined relationship with the series. It is a huge part of who I am as a human, who I am as a reader, who I am as an academic. I'm curious what your relationship to the series is. And my second question for you all, what other children's texts have food and emotional nourishment linked. The final thing is homework. I have one more episode planned to go along with Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and that is looking at the reader as a detective. We are going to talk about the very fun, marketable, mystery plotline that Philosopher's Stone has going for it and we are going to look at the reader as detective and some of the child detective work that's happening here alongside two other famous detective stories. So we are going to be reading A Scandal in Bohemia by Arthur Conan Doyle and The Purloined Letter by Edgar Allan Poe. Both of these texts are available in PDF for patrons on my Patreon page. So if you want to read along and see these detectives firsthand, you can find those there. And finally, we have to thank my patrons. These videos are free for you to watch because of their generous support. If you would like to support Lumos and the work that I am doing on this project, a link to the page is in the description box down below. That would be amazing. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you soon with episode three. Bye.